<laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome to the Regina Paul Show. Today I'm joined by the beautiful Lori Graham. Welcome, Lori. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is such a joy. It is. Yes, yes. Let's tell people what you're all about. So I like to tell a little story. I grew up in a household where women had to know what they wanted to do before they would go to college. And um, I actually went to school to study occupational therapy because I wanted to work with special needs kids. The only thing was that by the time I graduated, somehow I got whooshed into working in nursing homes with elderly people. And, and I then went into home care. And I also uh, started a master's in exercise science, but because I got married and moved, I never finished it. Well, fast forward, you know, about 15 years, and I felt like I was a square peg in a round hole. And I would look at my patients with all sorts of diseases. And since I was in their homes, I saw what they ate. You know, I saw what their diet and lifestyle were like. And most people who had illnesses really had the co-occurring condition of being overweight. And so their mobility was greatly affected. And um, I, I decided I wanted to go back to school because in my parallel life, you know, I was a vegan. I exercised every day. I competed in triathlons, in marathons. Wow. You know, so, so here I had this, that's why I felt like a square peg in a round hole. And um, I did, I went back to school, I finished my master's in exercise science, only so that I could take biochemistry, because as a nutritionist, you have to study nutritional biochemistry. Okay. okay. And so I did that, and um, my naturopath, because I was a consumer of natural approaches to healthcare, my naturopath said, you should go to the Institute for Functional Medicine. You'll get amazing training and it, it, you, you'll feel, it'll feel like a match for you. And I will tell you that my first course I went to in New York City, I felt like I'd come home. I met doctors, I met nutritionists, and everybody was on the prevention side of medicine, not on the fix it once it's broken. Uh -huh. and, 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 and it was it was humbling to me to see doctors who really wanted to reshape the way they were delivering health care. And I remember they had these groups. They broke us into like a group of four to practice some principles they were teaching us. And they had two doctors and two nutrition specialists together. And, and I will never forget the doctors, and they're still friends of mine. This is going back eight years. They're still friends of mine. Said, you know more about this than we know. You know more about and And there was such a sense of um, respect that went both ways, which I would not say I felt in traditional medicine as a nutritionist working, you know, calling doctor's offices and telling them what I was going to do with their patients and getting orders and things like that. Uh -huh. I didn't feel valued, but in this relationship, on the wellness side of things, I felt very validated. At any rate, I decided I was going to dive in and do the, it was about a two-year program, and we took lots of different courses and travel. I traveled to these different conferences, and then you have to sit and study for an exam. And so if you think about it, here I am, you know, an occupational therapist, I was studying nutrition at the same time, and I'm sitting and taking the same exam as doctors. So I had to learn a whole lot more of the science, you know, that, that I didn't get as a therapist, you know, the biochemistry and, and the physiology and stuff like that. So fast forward, I got out of therapy and I started working in weight loss. And, and that's how I, you know, started getting more and more experience in functional medicine because most people at some point in their lives deal with some weight loss, especially women, especially women who mm -hmm. have kids. You know, after the second or third kid, most women need some help kind of working with the hormonal issues that are going on so that they can, you know, shed the weight. But it also became a 
segue into functional medicine. So oh, can I share a little bit about functional medicine? Yes, I was gonna ask you about that, if you could explain that a little bit more. Right, because not everybody really knows what functional medicine. So no. if you were to think of traditional medicine versus functional medicine, traditional medicine, typically doctors are dealing with your symptoms. You go to the doctor, you have a symptom, and in 10 minutes, they're going to kind of ask some questions. And then they're going to say, OK, let's give you this drug or that drug or whatever. There's never a diet or lifestyle intervention. In functional medicine, we look at the root cause. We look at the constellation of all the things that may be going on in someone's life. So not just their diet, maybe their exercise, maybe their sleep, maybe toxins in their environment maybe even a genetic predisposition. And we look at all of how that affects the quality of, of one's life. And it's based in the same science as traditional medicine. Wow. So, so that's what's great about it. And that's why doctors you know, feel like they can affect a bigger change with their patients when they're using prevention kinds of approaches. So in functional medicine, I might do a history with somebody and go back all the way to their birth. You know, were you a vaginal delivery? Did your mom breastfeed you? Because that's the laying down of the microbiome. Um, did you have lots of antibiotics? Because if you did have lots of antibiotics, then the reality is that your immune system may be affected. You know, was there a lot of stress? Um, did you eat lots of vegetables? Were, you know, did you eat organic? All these things. And then what happens in life is we can have triggering events or mediators of disease. So, you know, a triggering event could be you've had three kids, <laughs> you know? Um, you know, a mediator could be you got Lyme disease or you got COVID, all of those things can put enough stress on one's system to have an kind of like a predisposition become expressed. Mm -hmm. and, and so going back and looking at, you know, where the root cause was or finding out if there are food sensitivities that are throwing off an immune response or an inflammatory response in the body. Looking at somebody's micronutrient um, status is, is also another valuable tip because maybe somebody is eating really well, but maybe that their digestion is off and they're not really absorbing the nutrients. So I really believe that the body has innate and innate ability to heal if we give it the right stuff exactly yes right yes, i totally agree with you yeah yeah i actually had um, a hormone issue and uh, i did some research myself and now i need a plant-based lifestyle because that's just best for me right right so. and and it's, it's interesting you say that because i guess just because of the people that were around me in my life at a formative kind of time, I started, I, it was in college, I actually couldn't tolerate the meat that they were serving. And, but they had salad bars set up and I would eat salads and I then I worked for food service. So I would make, you know, these plant-based meals. I was reading Adele Davis, this is like back in the eighties. And the interesting thing was all of a sudden my digestion improved. And I came home from college my freshman year for Thanksgiving and my mother served turkey. Now, I hadn't proclaimed I was a vegetarian. I just kind of morphed into more plant-based eating because I couldn't chew the meat that they were you know, preparing at college. Mm -hmm. and my mother served the turkey and I really couldn't palate it. Yeah. You know, like I went to chew it and I couldn't palate it. And so, you know, there was no, you know, in college, I didn't really know about nutrition the way I know now. But the interesting thing was 
my digestion improved, my menses. I, oh. I did not have, you know, the side effects, you know, of, yeah. of, you know, like the, you know, right before my period and things like that. I didn't have any of that. I sailed through menopause. I sailed through menopause. I had one hot flash, one. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so when and and I still stay really active and exercise. You know, this morning my husband and I went out for a three mile walk with the dog through the woods. You know, I'll go for a swim later this afternoon. You know, to me, exercise and diet and you know, I think also just a whole mindset. You know, and being mindful and lowering stress and getting you know good sleep and all those kinds of things. But but certainly diet and exercise have been the the two things that that I've really focused on that at my age, you know, I think I don't know a lot of other women my age that's that are as active as I am. Mm -hmm. You know, so you lead a pretty, pretty healthy lifestyle. Yeah. And, and, you know, years ago, I learned about the value of organic foods. And, you know, and then, you know, how about grass, the source of food. So I don't, I don't really I don't tell people they should be plant-based. I say they should have more plant-based food in their diets. You know, I, I am a voice for that. But I do believe, you know, for some people, it's great to have grass-fed beef. If you're gonna have beef, if you're going to have, you know, chicken, make sure they're, you know, cage-free and roaming. If you're gonna have fish, make sure it's not farm-raised, but it's, you know, wild. You know, the, those are very important things. If you're going to eat dairy, it should be from grass-fed cows. And, you know, it's actually harder and harder. I don't know about in Canada, but there's only one label now in the States, and it's Stonyfield Farm that still writes grass-fed, you know, cows on their yogurts. Um, you know? Yeah, I wouldn't be able to comment on that since I don't eat any meat and uh, my right, family doesn't right. eat as much either. They're not all plant-based, but right. You know, right. But when you, when you go in the store and you, you know, you look at labels, like that's the thing I, I'm always helping people with, mm -hmm. you know, when I, when I go to Whole Foods, I will look around and help people, you know, if they say, I found this at Whole Foods, what do you think? Or I'll look at the nut milks for people, you, you know, and tell them which ones I recommend and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, what is the difference between a naturopathic doctor then? So naturopathy is founded in many of the same principles, but it is a four-year medical degree, and you get, you know, a doctorate in naturopathy. Um, there's more of a focus perhaps in herbology, whereas I would have to choose to study that. Um, there's, you know, some naturopaths, at least in the states, and I know it's a little different in Canada, but in the states, you would actually, you could actually, or a lot of naturopaths study acupuncture as well, and they'll have practices where they're, you know, using maybe Chinese medicine or just regular herbology and looking at blood labs, and then they may be doing acupuncture as well. Okay, mm -hmm. um, I, I actually know a doctor of naturopathy in Canada. And she explained to me, it's very different. Like you can take certifications um, in any order that you want. It isn't like a four year program that you go through. And she actually said to me that as a naturopath, she cannot write a, um, a menu plan for somebody, which is like, oh. which to me, her licensing doesn't allow that. And, and I thought that is so interesting because in the states i mean your food is is food is biochemical information like it's part how can you just recommend supplements and not you know help somebody with a food plan yeah yeah i did not know that difference that's crazy yeah i know i know and yeah. i don't know i i would imagine that's canada in whole not just provinces i would think that she just said no i can't she said she would have a, a fine slap on her Wow. Yeah. Huh. Um, why is it so important, just going back to the grass-fed beef and the free-roaming chickens, why is that so important for our bodies? So basically, what you eat 
is what's in, you know, your muscles. So think about the animal that is fed conventionally raised or conventionally grown foodstuffs and, you know, big movement, um, you know, in the world, you know, thanks to certain interests, political interests is, is the whole genetic engineering space. Mm -hmm. And so most animals are fed a corn and a soy kind of mash of some sort. And both corn and soy typically are genetically engineered unless it says organic. And even with corn, there's some question because so much of the pollen and the, you know, the, the seeds that kind of get blown through the air are coming from a lot of the farms that are genetically engineered. So you have some hybridation, I guess, is the best way to, to describe that. So when you're feeding an animal corn and soy that's genetically engineered, the meat is different. The constitution is such that there's more of the omega-6 fatty acids, the pro-inflammatory kind of fatty acid, omega-6 fatty acid. Whereas in grass-fed animals, um, you actually have more omega-3s, which is more healthy. So, you know, that that's a big piece. The same thing, you know, with our chickens. You know, like think about your chickens and your and and your chick your your eggs and your chickens. You know, is yeah. if they're just feeding on the worms or you know the grass, they're they're feeding in nature. So again, the constitution of their meat is the same. The concern about fish when you buy fish that's actually farm raised. They're putting whatever they want to put in the water. It's not like it's in nature eating the algae, you, you know. So, so there and there's there's more toxins. And there's also um, I think there's um, a list that you can get on the safe foods. I forget what it's called. It's not like the Dirty Dozen, but it's something you know catchy like that. Mm -hmm. And and it will tell you which foods, which um, fish are the safest to eat. So larger fish tend to hold more toxins. Little fish like your sardines, you know, maybe smaller salmon, those are the fish, you know, the, the big, huge fish, you know, can, can hold more more toxins. Or rather, it's the ones that are closer will, will hold more toxins. That's what I mean to say also. But the smaller ones, like, like sardines, don't hold a lot. Awesome. And so, you know, knowing the source of your food is, is very important. Even when people go out to dinner, like, I don't know if you have a lot of this in Canada, maybe in the cities you do, but we have a lot of farm to table restaurants. So I live in the Northeast and the Hudson Valley is close by. And there's a lot of consciousness about raising the cows, you know, and letting the chickens run free and all of that stuff. And so mm -hmm. a lot of restaurants are falling to table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I definitely see the difference. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's hard yeah, no, it's okay. Um, I definitely see the difference between, like, my mom has, raises her own chickens as well. And the difference that I see is in the eggs that we get. The eggshell is much stronger and harder than the ones that you would buy from a grocery store. Right. How about the yolk? Is the yolk orange, more orange? It's it looks a lot healthier. It actually you can see the very clear defined, you know, um, like the, the colors are more defined as well. Right, right. It looks so much healthier. Right, right, right. When you get really good eggs, they're usually almost a little orange or not so yellow. Yeah. 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 What kind? What part of Canada are you from? Uh, we're in Manitoba. Oh, okay, that's west. Is it? Yeah, we're well, central. Oh, central. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, Lori, how many clients have you worked with now, like helping them with weight loss and like overall health and well-being? Been, it's been a long journey. I've probably put about 5,000 people through a couple of different, um, one, one a 
a position I was in and the other was a company I started. Um, so combined about 5,000 people through weight loss. And one of the things that the system, first of all, is um, a transformative system. I did it for, you know, maybe 10 pounds postmenopausally. And that's what got me so excited about it. Um, but what's, what's very clear to me is that there are some people that can drop weight with any type of a system. And my truth is, as long as you give up the junk food or the processed food, you're going to mm -hmm. fare a lot better than if you keep eating those foods. But the the there are some people that get it and they they actually will walk the talk after it's transformative then there are people that have some issues around binging or overeating or you know restriction you know sense sensed or perceived restriction mm -hmm. and and so the whole notion of sustainability is an area that I've really developed in this system over the course of time. And I've really also married the principles of functional medicine into my system because, listen, no two people are the same. We're all different a little bit biochemically, right? Mm -hmm. And so we need to work with some of that bioindividuality when we're helping somebody lose weight, but also keep it off. And yeah. so I use like a blood test, for example, I will go through somebody's blood test, but I have a medical software program and it analyzes the blood in a connect the dots kind of way, much like functional medicine. We call it orthomolecular biochemistry. So that you know that if, for instance, if your protein is low, and let's say your BUN, blood urea nitrogen, is, is a little elevated. It might be that you're not digesting your protein so well, but if your protein is normal and your BUN is high, then you're gonna go, well, maybe your liver is having a challenge. And so the software program integrates all that information and it comes up with supplements that help bring the body into better balance and the explanation of how those measurements will connect are, are right there in that algorithm when i go through that with somebody people often say wow it's like having a psychic reading it's like <laughs> like it's like i know that about me you know it connects the dots with their own personal experience of themselves Wow. And so, yes, that's powerful. Yeah. That's very powerful. The other thing that the software program does is, and, and this is important, um, I think it's an important distinction. In traditional blood labs, there's a range, and let's say the range is from five to 20, and that's considered the normal range. But with orthomolecular biochemical types of assessments, we go, into where we discuss more the um, the optimal range. And the optimal range means you're being compared to all healthy people. And it's a narrow range, so that might be 10 to 15. But most of the time, when you get a blood test, right on that, you know, if you go to Quest or you go to LabCorp, it says on it, you know, normal range. That's the range of people both healthy and non-healthy. You don't want to be in. You don't want to be compared to a range of healthy and non-healthy people. You want to be compared to people who are healthy. Oh, and exactly. then, if you fall a little bit out of that, let's say five to ten range, you can bring it back with a dietary, you know, um, shift, or maybe you would recommend a supplement. But doctors, a traditional doctor, would feel you're in the normal range and not see a problem there. Yeah. It's a very powerful distinction and it makes it more actionable. Yeah, for sure. You yeah. know, Lori, what I found now with this huge like plant-based diet um, boom that we see, right? Right. It's turning the actual, 
what are, what plant based actually means into more of a processed diet. You know, you find those plant based burgers at the NW or wherever, right? Right, like the Beyond Burger or Impossible yes. Burger, things like that. It was manufactured in the in the in a manufacturing plant. That's not healthy anymore. Right. And, right. And well, just, we do in the yeah, what we do in the name of convenience. You know, and I've tried, I think it was the Beyond Burger. The other one is genetically engineered. And, I, you know, I tried it, and I wouldn't say never, never have it. But understand the distinction that if you choose something that's real, that's in nature, yeah, that's the way it was intended to be, which is why, even though I don't choose for myself, why I would say eat the grass fed burger instead of the, like the Beyond Burger has pea protein and, you know, mm. all these other things in it, right? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, oftentimes I, I have a funny little, do you remember Ghostbusters from years ago? The yeah. movie? So I think about cabinet busters and, you, you know, I help my patients go through a cabinet busting set, session. It's, and, and COVID has really opened this up because. I can now, you know, say, take me into your kitchen cabinets. Let's make it safe, like a feng shui. And people don't realize that many of the packaged foods they have have way more ingredients than are needed. It's one thing if you make a cake and you put the ingredients into the cake and maybe instead of refined sugar, you're going to use coconut sugar. Or maybe you're going to make it more keto. Uh -huh. Maybe you'll make it without flour. You know, that's a whole different thing. But when you're buying something from the supermarket and you see, you, you know, like 10 lines of ingredients, that that's when you know to run the other way. If you can't read an ingredient, run the other way. You know, exactly. I, I had a patient recently who has Crohn's disease. No, celiac. No, Crohn's. He has Crohn's. And he came to me um, because somebody had mentioned you need to work with a, you know, with, with a functional medicine practitioner, but also with a nutritionist. And he had had a gallbladder attack and he was in the hospital and he was actively bleeding. And he really didn't have, being a young person, he didn't have an idea of how to eat. And so I got him a medical food shake that had, I did a lot of research for this, had a lot, had all the nutrients that he would need. And, and so that was important because we are weeding him off of the junk food. You know, he would be doing his work and maybe driving back a long trip from wherever he was working and would stop to get gas and then get potato chips and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and then he'd be sitting on the toilet the next day. So now we have him on, a, a real food diet and we have him conscious about the origin of his food so we thought i'm going to move a little more um plant-based i'm going to do some different things so he found a tofu dish but it came in a package and it had a lot of things in it and he was duped by it being vegan right mm -hmm. and he got really sick you know, in terms of his digestion, he ended up on the toilet for a few hours. And so, you know, generally, and, and this is the way I work in, in functional medicine, I will do some fancy labs to help identify where there are imbalances. You know, with this gentleman, I did a an entire gut restoration program. You know, I also did a gallbladder cleanse with him. And it's important to really work on that personalized level because many imbalances can cause one disease, but also it, it's kind of like one imbalance can cause many different diseases. Yeah. And you don't know which it is. You really don't know which it is. But in traditional medicine, Nobody digs, you know, doctors tell their patients, you know, you're borderline diabetic, you know, you need to lose some weight. 
And if a year later they come back and they didn't lose weight and they're now diabetic, the doctor's like, I need to put you on a medicine. You know, yeah. we are such oh, a... Wow. Right. We are a specialized medical world. Why not recommend somebody to a nutritionist, you know, or do some digging and find out if anybody is is able to help your patients lose weight, you know? And I, I think it's it's a sad statement. And, um, you know, I think medicine has its, traditional medicine has its place. It really does. It has its strengths. But, but we have an obesity epidemic. Yeah. In, in, yeah, in, we, we certainly do. Yeah, we do. And we, and we, you know, more people die of, of diseases related to obesity than any other disease. Yeah. And the crazy thing is, too, that that could have been prevented. Their deaths can actually be prevented. Correct. Most, most of the chronic diseases, in fact, all of the chronic diseases that are known to mankind at this point in time, are completely modifiable through diet and lifestyle interventions. I often tell people that it's almost like there's a bell curve, you know, when you go like the bell curve, and most people when they lose weight or do a system like the one I teach and they learn about food behaviors and they learn about the source of their food and they have this blood test done and they're coached. I also have coaching set up every single day. So people will be accountable because <laughs> it's important to be accountable and to, and, but to also have somebody cheering you on. Exactly. But, but the whole, what happens is people's headaches go away. People's inflammation. I had a guy lose close to 35 pounds and he had football injuries as a high school kid. He doesn't have pain anymore. Now, part of it is the weight's not pulling on his lower back. The other part of it is all the plant-based foods that he's eating now or incorporating into his diet are anti-inflammatory. Yeah, that is so huge. Right, so most people will fall under the bell curve. And then there are some people where, you know, maybe they don't, maybe there still are some symptoms that exist, like maybe the thyroid, you know, gland didn't straighten out and people still have you know, low thyroid. So I can do other labs and look at other things. Like I can do a food intolerance test. And, you know, that looks at what your body's forming an IgG or IgG is like the delayed branch of the immune system. But that gives a lot of information about what foods are not really ideal for you. Mm -hmm. You know, so you know, even doing like um, when, when women have PCOS, sometimes they're not metabolizing their hormones. So looking at a urine sample to see what hormones they're metabolizing, if they're not metabolizing, that means those hormones are backing up in the system mm -hmm. and making them feel sick. Yeah, they're not being carried out by the fiber that they require, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, that that's kind of like the breath and the, the extent, you know, functional medicine can work, you know, on, on, on anything. And, you know, I even run genetic tests sometimes. Here's another example. You know, in Connecticut, they just passed mandatory vaccinations for kids in school. And it was, um, it was a very sad day for a lot of parents that had gone to Capitol and you know, uh, Robert Kennedy, you know, Bob Kennedy goes in and fights for this. And so, you know, I've been working with genetics for a while and I have had a couple of kids with delays. Um, mothers found me and, and I've run a particular panel that looks at some of the biochemical pathways that govern some of their detoxification ability and some of their neurological capacity and basically when you're using genetics it's not just to see well am i going to die of heart disease it's not that that's not responsible use of genetics what's responsible use is understanding where 
your biochemistry and my biochemistry might be a little bit different. So I sometimes will make this analogy. If you have a ladder going up to a roof and you have all those rungs there, let's say the third and the fourth and the eighth rung are broken. You're not going to get up to the roof. And that's what a biochemical pathway is. You're going from one place to the next place and you have various enzymes that have to be in place to make those transitions biochemically, to make something happen. Like our body does this innately, but for some people, they're lacking certain enzymes to carry out a function. So when I look at autistic kids, for example, I don't think it's just the vaccines. I think it's a well, I think we over-vaccinate kids. I will say that we give them too many at one time and we give them way too many. But it's also, it's a gen- it may be a genetic weakness in terms of how their liver is detoxifying, how their brain is, you know, lowering the inflammation from the other ingredients in the vaccine. Um, there's other things to look at like gut integrity. I believe that since not everybody's conscious about what they put in their kids' mouths, not every mother has the knowledge to feed their kids organic, plant-based, and stay away from the sugar and the wheat and all the things that can damage the intestinal lining. And so these kids are like the kids who get autism are the ones that that kind of have a weak, um, they just don't have resilience. They don't have that resilience. So on this particular genetic test, um, you could look for where there may be um, a weakness, let's say, in turning off neurological brain inflammation. You could look at if somebody's, if a kid is able to detoxify through the different metabolic pathways that the liver has to go through. And if a kid is lacking some of that, you could supplement for like two months in advance of a child taking a vaccine and give them back some of that metabolic stability and resilience. Okay. So does that actually then improve? Like, is there a change within the child if you give them the supplement? So when they've done it, yes. So so when when they've done these labs, so so the doctor who actually developed the genetic test that I use, that the company that I use, they had studied. They had taken seventy two kids that with autism in in their you know clinic, and they actually looked at genetic variations and they found patterns and those are the genes that they put in the panel when particular genes that explained liver detoxification if one wherever there was more of a clustering of common deficits that was the gene that they took and so they they developed i don't know maybe there are 50 genes in this panel something like that but what happened over the years since they've been looking at these genes, you know, now they have 300 kids in their cohort and they, the, 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 the extra kids that came along actually verify and validate that the genes they chose were right. So they're seeing, yes, they're seeing even more similarity in that larger group. They're seeing more similarity with regards to genetic, what we call moly, polymorphisms, which are really just um, a change in the genetic code, which is causing certain enzymes to not be as active or as powerful as they should be. They're, they're watered down, kind of. Okay, so they could have then a complete like personality change mm-hmm. that is behavioral change and sensory change absolutely and so but if you knew that about i used to say this and it was kind of like 
a little flippant of me, but I used to say, you know, before they gave a chemo agent to patients, they would, they run your genetics and do what's, what's called pharmacogenetics. They look to see what chemo agent is going to work better for your unique biochemistry. So I'm like, why are we not doing this for our most precious commodity, our children? Yeah. Like, why are we not testing them ahead of time and giving them perhaps some supplements to boost their function so that they don't have those problems? And of course, with, you know, vaccinations, you know, you have to spread them out. They, you know, they give too many vaccinations at once and these poor little brains, they're still growing and developing. They're giving them to infants. Yeah. So would you recommend then that people do that at a later stage, like for their children? I, I would. I'm not a doctor, so stay in my lane. But through observation, I would do it as late in life as, you know, you can in the child's life. Because, you know, obviously now in Connecticut, since you the only way you can't be vaccinated is if you have a medical problem. Um. So I would say spread them out and, you know, stay on top of how your kid responds and keep notes. You know, I didn't even know this, but I'm a grandma. And my son said that every time they go to the doctor, the doctor says, how many words is your daughter saying? Like they're tracking what is considered the neurological expression, right? Which, you know, your words, right? And, and that to me is like, they're, they're tracking what's happening when kids develop, but also if they are immunizing them, what else is happening? Are we seeing language delays? Are we seeing sleeping patterns, you know, become bad? Are we seeing behavioral issues? You know, are we seeing more ADD, ADHD and things like that? Wow, that's important. So they're tracking that with my kids. I don't remember a doctor ever asking those questions, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I guess changes are happening then, right? So yeah, we have a world that is far more toxic. You know, we have, we, we have, we, people are more stressed in general. Um, mm-hmm. We have an obesity pandemic. We have a problem with food equality. And so, you know, government thinks that the answer to food equality is impossible burgers and beyond burgers. And, you know, and and they also think that, you know, we just have to genetically engineer so that we don't lose, you know, crop. But we don't realize that when we make a change like that, there's a cascading effect somewhere else. You know, every, everything is kind of holographic in my 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 viewpoint everything's holographic and so you can't change one thing here and have something not change somewhere else exactly well that's why we're having a problem with the bees disappearing right the bees also right 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 there was a movie a while ago i don't know if you got to see it It was called the little farm and it was about it was about a couple that moved you know to to have their own farm and when certain animals were killing their animals, they shot the animals, but then they realized that those animals were able to keep the agriculture the way it was supposed to be. And, and then they ultimately learned over a long period of time, and I'm really, I'm trashing what this was about, but I'm, I'm gonna give you the punchline, was through their journey, they realized how to live in harmony with every wild animal that was around because they had a role for killing insects, for example. Like they they kind of, you know, they got in tune with nature, yeah. you know? Yeah. I think this pandemic is really bringing people back down to that, right? Because like when everything was shut down, you just see the animals are coming out more and more, you know, you're like, right. no, and not as many, not as many cars. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Not yeah. as many cars. 
Right, right. So the pollution is a little bit less. And people are probably sleeping more because they gain back a couple of hours of commuting every day. You, you know, quite honestly, for me, I love working on Zoom with my patients. I feel like I'm with them. I don't have to drive an hour and 10 minutes across a bridge, you know, to get to an office. I I get to be one on one and and I I can I can do my work as well as if I was sitting face to face opposite somebody. Okay. You know, yeah, and medicine, you know what I what I heard recently is because the government here in the states made all the changes with regards to reimbursing doctors for uh, consultations via telehealth, they're saying that that's not going to end. And so, you know, part of my vision is, I, I think we have an inequality with healthcare delivery as well, in the sense that people who have greater assets take, take advantage of, of, let's say of my services, okay? But if I, if I offer my services in a group, I can lower the cost and serve more people. Mm-hmm. And so that that's kind of where I'm at now with my practice. And I actually started a group around October. I'm, I'm big into the longevity kind of space as well. Um, I would be because of my, my age. But I really, um, there's a lot of research on fasting and, and the whole um, way that fasting will help you recycle old organelles but also help with stem cell growth and so there's a company called prolon and they make the fasting mimicking diet i think you can get it in canada and i had a a few women who kind of followed me from a previous company that that ended up closing due due to poor money management and um i had about 15 women and we started in october right around Halloween and we did three months, a week of the fasting mimicking diet. And then I created a plan to go along with it. So once a month they did the prolon fasting mimicking diet. I don't need to go into that now, but we started in October and then we did one again for Thanksgiving. And then we did one again right after Christmas, you know, for the new year. And by the end of the three months, I had 10 women in this group. I had actually eight women, two men. Everybody wanted to continue with the group, everybody. And so now I'm thinking, what am I gonna come up with for material? How much can I talk about? (laughs) And so when I joined this women's marketing group, I started meeting other women who had gifts in like mindfulness or herbology, like a naturopath did in a herbology talk. So I bring in a guest speaker um, almost every other week at this point. My promise was once a month, but I'm, I'm meeting people faster than I can help. And and so every I brought in a chiropractor last week. You know, I have a psychologist coming next week, and everybody is loving, loving, loving the contribution. And they're thinking about all the other things that really create wellness, like joy, like fun, you know, like relaxation, you know, you know, like like they're thinking about all the other things that as the world is opening up, they can now take advantage of again. Yeah, for sure. You know? So so that's my group. And 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 what happens also in the group is I have everybody share their trials and tribulations, sticking to, you know, whatever plan they're on or just maintenance. And, you know, somebody will share a recipe. Another person will say, you know, I do this and it makes it easier. And so this group is and it's magical. It is in completely magical. And it's been my community, you know. It, since COVID, it, it was it was my lifesaver. It was my lifesaver. Mm-hmm. You know, and and you know now anybody that I put through, our you know my weight loss plan when they're done with the more intensive back and forth every single day, they go into that group as 
as the as the maintenance plan. Nice. Yeah, it, it looks beautiful. It's just been it's been beautiful. So so that's you know if anybody who you know now hears this on you know your Facebook page, um, you know they can absolutely you know reach out to me about that. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Well, it has been such a pleasure talking to you today, Lori. You definitely know your stuff. Like what I did my research uh, just to kind of fix my issue that I had also with menses and hormones. Um, I definitely didn't dive in as deep as you did, um, but uh, it's it has been a pleasure speaking with you, and I just have Thank a couple you. of questions for you. Sure. Uh, so the one last question I have is, um, do you have a gift or anything that you would like to offer to the audience today? So yes, I do. It's nice of you to ask me that. What I would love to do is um, leave my information. I don't know where you would put that you know, with our talk, but, but certainly my email is fine. Um, and, and I, I'd love to give a free consultation. I do 20 minute, you know, discovery calls and that'll give somebody a good sense of whether or not what I do is what they need, but also, um, you know, they'll get one or two things behaviorally or food wise that they can do to set them on track. And then if they want to take advantage of my services after, then we can move in that direction. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. You want to just uh, put that in the comment section after the video has been posted. That would be great. Sure. I will do that. Absolutely. When do you plan on posting? Uh, it'll go up like right away as soon as. Oh, right away. Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay, good. I'll do that. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you for this opportunity. Oh, yeah, it's been a pleasure. I've been meeting uh, so many people and, you know, this kind of like brings us more down to a personal level and, you know, discussing important topics every week, right? So it's nice. Fun. That's great. Good luck with what yeah. you're doing too. Yes, thank you. I have one more question. Yeah. And that is, what would you do in the zombie apocalypse? The zombie apocalypse. What's that? Tell me what the zombie apocalypse is. <laughs> that's, that's like post, post COVID syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, like the walking dead and fear the walking dead. Like, you know, I don't have a connection to that, but, no? <laughs> but can I, can I say this? Yes. I think our entire healthcare system needs to be pivoted. And I think, I think, and, and I actually have an opportunity possibly to do that. I'll find out in the middle of the month. Um, but, but I think we need, we need to have functional medicine centers all over, you, you know, all over. And we need to be teaching people the essentials of, of how to stay healthy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So but what, but what is the zombie apocalypse? I don't know what that is. is <laughs> it's that like, it's, uh, I guess it's just some kind of disease that turns a person into um, a flesh eating being. So they would then eat, you know, eat you, they'd be kind of dead, but right, still right, right. Is this a television program? I think I heard about that. Yeah, yeah. Some... yeah it's just... Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I like to ask people what they would do if that would happen now. I mean, we're, we're living through COVID right now. It doesn't do that to us, right? Well, so I have land up in Cape, in Cape Breton, my husband's family. I would move up there onto that island. <laughs> <laughs> Good. That's what I would do. <laughs> and I'd take my granddaughter and go. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen, but I think some other things are going to happen possibly, but it's a different world. Yeah, it sure is. It sure is. A different world. So let's keep our bliss and our joy and you know, kind of keep our zen and, and maybe it'll mushroom out. You know, that that was, you know, mm -hmm. that's the hope. Sure. All right, awesome. Thank you so much again, Lori. Have a Thank fabulous you. Sunday. You too, you as well. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.